redistricting, the most political of processes here in Texas politics. It's a process that will determine the political disposition of lawmakers and through them policy for the next decade and beyond here in the Lone Star State. The Texas legislature is currently in the midst of deciding on political boundaries for 38 U.S. congressional districts, 31 state senate districts, 150 state house districts, and 15 state board of education districts. I'm Jeremy Kitchen with Texas Scorecard, and this is an inside look at how the decennial redistricting process works in Texas and what it will mean for you and your family well into the future. listening to Redistricting Texas, a short series featuring Brandon Waltons and Jeremy Kinchin. The decennial redistricting process is upon us, a process that was due to take place during the 87th regular legislative session earlier this year, but was delayed due to a holdup with the U.S. Census data, originally supposed to be received in April. Instead, that data came in mid-August and has prompted the process to take place during the ongoing third called special legislative session, among other items on Governor Greg Abbott's special session agenda. Here to join me as we talk about this process and what it means going forward is Trey Trainer. Uh, my name is Trey Trainer. I am currently a commissioner on the Federal Election Commission. Um, that's a position that I was appointed to by President Donald Trump and confirmed by the Senate to. Uh, I have a term that expires in 2023. And uh, prior to that, I had my own private practice um, and have been involved in the Texas redistricting process. Uh, going all the way back to 2003. The redistricting process itself is largely a complicated one. Provisions in both the U.S. and Texas constitutions aid in guiding the process and set out parameters for district boundary apportionment. Sure. So every 10 years, the U.S. Constitution requires that there be a census done of all of the people in the United States. And then that number is used to apportion the 435 seats in the House of Representatives. And each, uh, so you take 435 and divide it by the total population. That tells you how many people should be in each individual uh, house district. And then they take that and divide it amongst the uh, 50 states. And so for uh, this cycle in 2022, Texas has uh, roughly uh, 29 million, a uh, little over 29 million people. So uh, Texas ends up with 38 of the congressional seats, which is a pickup of uh, two seats from what we had 10 years ago. The process itself is guided by certain rules designed to not allow for explicit advantages or disadvantages to drawn boundaries. The, there are several rules that you have to go by uh, in, in the process. Uh, first, the U.S. Constitution covers um, what has to be done with congressional districts. And there, all congressional districts have to be exactly equal in population. Uh, so they have to have the exact same number of people in them. Uh, and then the state constitution governs how the state house and state senate districts are drawn. Uh, state senate districts are going to be quite large this time with us having 31 senators. You're going to be at almost or you'll be at over three quarters of a million people. Uh, I'm sorry, you'll be at close to a million people in a state senate district, uh, about three quarters of a million people in a congressional district. And uh, then your state house seats are obviously smaller than that because you're dividing the total population by the 150 members of the house. Um, and there are some particular rules with regard to the house uh, that require the state legislature to keep counties uh, whole as much as they possibly can uh, without without splitting them. Now, obviously, in certain circumstances, you ha- end up having to split counties one place or the other. But uh, in our major metropolitan areas, uh, Harris County, Dallas County, Tarrant County, Bear County, uh, all of those counties will have uh, state house seats that are contained within the county without going outside the boundaries. Uh, and then the more rural areas of the state will have multiple counties joined together in the redistricting process. This cycle marks the first time in over 50 years Texas will not be subject to additional federal scrutiny 
under a process known as preclearance. When the Voting Rights Act was passed in uh, 1965, Texas actually wasn't covered under the preclearance requirement. Uh, it was later added as a preclearance state uh, based upon uh, the language minorities that we have in the state. And so uh, it was in the 70s that Texas came under the preclearance rule. And what the preclearance rule said is that once the state changed an election law, and of course redistricting would be an election law, uh, they had to go get permission from the Department of Justice in Washington, D.C., or from a three-judge panel uh, in the D.C. District Court to say that there was no discrimination in that particular enactment by the legislature uh, or the districts that had been drawn. Uh, and it, so basically it had to be blessed by somebody in Washington, D.C. before it was implemented. Um, there was a case that was brought Shelby County um, uh, in uh, uh, Alabama that was... Uh, that, that challenged Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, which is the preclearance portion, and the Supreme Court struck down the formula by which preclearance uh, was adopted. And so all of the states that were under preclearance are no longer under preclearance. So this will be the first time that Texas does not have to do a submission to the Department of Justice or to a three-judge panel um, to automatically review what's, what's happened uh, in the redistricting process. Since the process is taking place later in the year, the approval of maps and the almost inevitable threat of litigation as a result provide for concerns as the 2022 election cycle begins. Well, I think first and foremost, the, the legislature did recognize that the, there was going to be a time frame problem. Uh, so they did pass a bill during the regular session that would allow them to back the primaries up. Um, and by necessity, uh, the, the lateness with which this redistricting process is being done, um, you have to do that because once you draw the districts at the state level, both for congressional and state house and even for state Senate, um, the counties then have to engage in a process of going through and looking at each one of their voting precincts uh, because we have very specific laws in the uh, Texas election code that say that you can only have a certain number of people in a voting precinct. And so, and those voting precincts may have shifted from, you know, congressional district one to congressional district two. And so you have to do that, that redividing uh, has to take place. So that's one just kind of natural element of delay that you're going to have is the process by which the counties engage. But the other part of it is, is that there's absolutely going to be litigation uh, coming out of uh, the redistricting, it always is. Um, you know, it's a very partisan activity. Um, it's it's one where Republicans and Democrats are pitted against each other. Uh, you know, trying to buy for the most seats, uh, and so they're gonna they're gonna take every shot they can. And, and courts are often the way to do that. The unique element for this particular cycle of redistricting is is that we'll probably see more litigation at the state level than we will at the federal level. The, the Supreme Court uh, has kind of taken away a lot of the jurisdiction for federal courts to handle uh, redistricting cases uh, based on the past couple of terms uh, in cases that they've handled. So uh, you'll see a lot more of this being litigated at the state level. And that's not to say that there won't be federal cases that are filed because obviously there'll be constitutional concerns, uh, but I think we'll see a lot more state court activity. Outside of all of those considerations, the ongoing process, now delayed, creates additional concerns and considerations as well related to candidate filing periods and election dates themselves. Because the process did not take place during the regular legislative session, there is a possibility that the normal candidate filing period, primary elections, and primary runoff elections get delayed. For incumbent elected officials, this could prove problematic. In the most recent special legislative session, which ended in September, Texas lawmakers passed Senate Bill 13, which acted as a sort of stopgap measure in the event final approval of redistricting boundaries goes beyond certain dates. For example, if maps are approved by November 15th of 2021, the candidate filing period, primary election date, and primary election runoff date take place in the normal scheduled time frame. If the maps are not finally approved by then, but instead approved before December 28th, 2021, the candidate filing period gets delayed to January of 2022, with the primary election date instead being that of April 5th and potential runoff election date on June 21st, 2022. 
If maps still are not approved by then, but approved by February 7th of 2022, the candidate filing period will take place near the end of February to early March, with the primary election at the end of May and any runoff election near the end of July 2022. Potential delays could not only be as a result of lawmakers not coming to an agreement, but also the almost inevitable litigation that will spawn once the boundaries are finally approved. So it it could continue to be delayed beyond what the legislature has delayed the uh, primaries. The, The court could come in and say, well, I need to take a look at what the map does and take a look at these claims. And so they could judicially push off the primaries uh, by a matter of by months, if if need be, uh, you know they'll they'll try to do their best to to get something done quickly, knowing that the state has to have uh, elections and that that needs to be a fair process. Uh, but it's not unheard of for there to be a significant delay to where primaries are happening almost you know a month or so in advance of general elections taking place. Um, so you could have that kind of uh, activity taking place here, especially given the fact that we were so delayed in getting the census information. We have not had to deal with this type of delay in getting the census information. And, you know, everybody wants to blame the census delay on uh, the pandemic. But frankly, it's a function of the way the census was done. Uh, it was very politicized. And the data that's being or that was pr- originally proposed to be used and now the data that is being used uh, had some significant statistical flaws in it that have never been present in any of the data that we've used uh, in redistricting in the past. So this, this is the first time that we have uh, we have some specific court rulings that say there's certain data points that you have to look at um, and those data points have been statistically manipulated by the Census Bureau um, this cycle. And so it's making the it's making the drawing process harder for those that have to draw the maps. And it's going to make the litigation process uh, even longer, I believe, because you're going to have new expert witnesses testifying to new statistical findings that, that nobody's had to deal with uh, in this process. So I anticipate a significant delay in when the primaries are going to happen. Um, And again, I wouldn't be surprised if they get pushed up very closely to uh, the November elections. Couple all of that with the very real possibility that lawmakers themselves cannot come to an agreement, particularly in the Texas House of Representatives. Composed of 150 lawmakers, the legislative chamber currently has a total of 82 Republicans and 66 Democrats, as one seat is currently vacant and the other recently elected another Republican lawmaker who has yet to be sworn into office. As such, besides partisan motivations, many of those lawmakers represent significantly different regions of the state, and those considerations all get dovetailed into the overall redistricting process, making agreements and negotiations additionally tenuous. Uh, if they if they pass them, the next thing that you'll see is, uh, I mean, they go, they're just like any other bill. They have to go to the governor to be signed by the governor to, to take effect. Um, I, I anticipate that you'll see litigation filed shortly thereafter. Um, you'll probably see sort of some sort of temporary injunction entered against the use of those maps. Um, I'll tell you the bigger concern that I have with regard to this 30 day special session is whether or not they even get maps passed during the process. Mm-hmm. Um, I, for the life of me, am not able to count up to 76 votes in the House to be able to figure out how they're going to pass a map uh, there, given that the, the Speaker of the House relies so heavily on the Democratic caucus for most of his votes. And you have Republican members who are being paired in the map that they've put out who may not necessarily want to be paired Um, because of significant loss of population in West and East Texas. You have districts that are going away um, and the different dynamics of of the people who are in sitting in the legislature, not running again or running for some other seat uh, gives them a particular interest in what goes on with the congressional map, what goes on with the Senate map and those type of things. So at the end of the day, Uh, you know, I I think you're in for a lengthy process uh, that involves a lot of litigation. The only certainty when it comes to the decennial redistricting process is that there will inevitably be winners and losers. Sometimes the issue is one of a partisan nature, but in fact, the majority of the time, it's much more about maintaining control by whatever leadership coalition exists in each legislative chamber. 
This means that the process instead normally rewards lawmakers who are compliant with leadership and seeks to penalize lawmakers who are not. Regardless, the redistricting process is one of which is only a public process for a short time, though it's been subject to private negotiations between those who draw the boundaries for upwards of at least two years preceding it. The process Texans see now is one that has only recently manifested itself publicly and will have political ramifications for the next decade and beyond in the Lone Star State. Redistricting Texas is a production of Texas Scorecard. You can find more stories and journalism at texasscorecard.com. If you like today's show, please consider subscribing and leaving a review on whatever podcast platform you listen on.